Latrice, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Um, my name is Latrice Williams, um, and I am a real estate broker here in Spokane, Washington. Um, I service Spokane County and its surrounding areas. I've been a real estate broker for almost five years. In June, it'll be five years. And I, I actually say I'm a real estate broker, but I'm a managing broker. <laughs> I'm a managing broker, so I manage real estate agents. Um, last year, I launched, oh, it's been almost two years. My goodness. Um, two years ago, I launched a team called Williams Home Girl Sales, and that was underneath um, a brokerage, um, Realty One Group Eclipse. Uh, last Tuesday, January 4th, I launched my own brokerage. So now I am the proud owner of Vision Properties. Uh, real estate firm. So I am working diligently to utilize this opportunity to provide space for folks who may have been overlooked in the past as I was. Just to give a little bit of a backstory, I came, I started, excuse me, when I got out of prison. I did a seven-year stint in prison and uh, for drug crime. And when I came home, I knew that I was not the same person. I had completely rehabilitated. I had changed my life. And I think that a lot of people forget that, especially those that are formerly incarcerated. When you come home, things have just been moving and people will, they won't be as easily um, swayed by just you saying that you've changed. So I worked really hard um, those first two years or so to prove that, you know, I had changed. I got a good job. I sought out housing. Um, in my my job, I was making pretty good money at the time. I thought it was great, <laughs> you know, twenty four hundred a month. It allowed me to apply for housing, and when I did apply for housing, and the reason why I had to apply for housing so quickly is because I wanted to um, reunify with my children. But unfortunately, when I went to go apply for housing, even though they told me that uh, you know it had been a long enough time away, that they had to deny me because of my history, and that. That was a sad thing. That was a sad day because I had worked so hard and was working so hard to prove myself being a different person. And then I couldn't even get somewhere to live. And so I did have um, a setback there where I felt like just for that moment, I didn't want to do this anymore. I wanted to give up. And I called out to um, a mentor of mine. And, you know, I call her mentor now, but I called out to a friend of mine at the time who was um, heavily connected with um, different organizations. And and she said, no, you're not going to give up. She said, you're not going to give up. She said, you are going to keep going. I'm going to be an advocate for you. And that's exactly what she did. She advocated for me and um, they called me probably within 20 minutes and told me that I had gotten the property, gotten the apartment. So that was my first apartment at home. I ended up being able to uh, reunify with my children. I got all of my children back. In total, I had um, five kids at the time. And so reunifying with my children was a big deal for me and, and made me feel more wholesome. And then uh, later on, a couple of years, about a year later, I ventured off into starting into real estate and I had my sixth son and I said, there, there has to be a better way. And I know that God had been sending me into the direction about houses. I would have dreams about houses. And, and we always talk about what is our purpose? Like what? What are we here for? Because we all are here for some type of purpose, right? So we're always like, God, show me what my purpose is. And and sometimes our purpose is laying right there in our face and we don't realize it. So I went in and, and like I said, took my real estate exam after lots of t- tugging and pulling and not wanting to. And we just went in and did it. And so I went in and I, at first I kept my job. <laughs> I kept my job because I was nervous I wouldn't make enough money. Everybody was telling me I had to save up all this money to be in real estate. And I went in and went for my first training meeting and something, and I know there was a couple of some things and I don't really want to go into detail, but I knew then I had to quit my job and go full force into real estate. And I did that. And after I did that, after I quit my job and went full force into real estate, two weeks later, I had my first sale under contract and I didn't stop from then. Um, six months later, I started doing um, training, real estate training for, uh, they asked me if I wanted to join the leadership team. And mind you, I've only been in real estate for six months at this time. So uh, and my managing broker at the time just said, listen, I want you to join the leadership team because I want people to believe in themselves just as much as you believe in yourself. I want you to show them how 
you do it so that we can have more people that can turn around kind of and do it like you. And so I joined the leadership team. I started teaching people kind of what I was doing um, in the digital um, age. Um, and uh, I started, I had my team within a team, which means I had even being on a real estate team, I had team members, two other team members that were underneath me that I would give leads to. And I would help show them how to um, kind of speak to those folks and follow up with them and make sure that they didn't have any questions that they needed answered. So after a while, I said, well, I'm doing all this for everybody else, but what do I need to do for myself? And so I ventured off and became an independent agent right before actually, oh, I missed the big part right before <laughs> I became an independent agent uh, for the year 2018, 2019, I was the rookie of the year for the firm, the brokerage that I was at at the time, which was when I made it to when I was the, the rookie of the year. So that that put me at the top 20 percent. They invited me to the top 20 percent basically group. of. And I will say this when I walked into the room and you probably I don't know if you want to release that brokerage name or not. I probably shouldn't have said it, but um, because it might make some folks feel some type of way. But when I walked into the room, you know, little me, um, formerly incarcerated, young, black, really moving very quickly. I walked into the room, sat down in this huge seat, feeling like I was in the mafia. And this is it's this huge table. I mean, probably about, I don't know, 40 or 50 seats around the table. Maybe I could be exaggerating, but it was a lot. I felt pretty small in there. And looking around the room, I didn't see anybody that looked like me. Furthermore, um, there were a couple women but furthermore, as I looked around the room and felt like, oh my God, I don't belong here. Like, what am I doing here? How did I even get here? I was getting looks back at me like, you don't belong here. What are you doing here? Right? So they were confirming what I felt about myself. Those negative thoughts that I felt about myself, I did not feel comfortable. And I decided, you know what? I think within the next two weeks, I decided that I needed to find somewhere else to go that I felt like I was going to thrive at. I went from there to say, you know, I've always thought that I need to kind of own whatever I'm doing because I want to be able to help people that are like me because not everybody, I feel like, gets the same opportunity to be who they want to be. Even though we're preaching a lot of that right now, we're preaching a lot of inclusion, a lot of all these things, equity and equality, but let's be real when we're talking about, you know, equity and equality and things that have not been, you know, and diversity and inclusion and things that have not been in play for the past 500 years or whatever, you know, or for a lifetime, right? Women, even back in Bible days had to, they couldn't wear pants or they couldn't, you know, they had to have something covering their head. So when you're talking about eliminating that type of systemic oppression, it takes a second. It's going to take a second to break down barriers. And I am in the middle of all this. Being a young lady, just fresh out, you know, on the streets, I didn't have the tools that I felt like would help me to succeed. And I, it wasn't necessarily that I didn't have the tools, take that out, but it was that I didn't feel like I had the space. I wasn't in the right space to grow and to learn. And so I left from that brokerage and went to a very, a much smaller firm with a, with a, a beautiful, gorgeous woman who taught me a whole lot about running a team and what it was like to actually investigate for my answers and to do research and to take responsibility and to have a family. And that's what I felt at that brokerage. And I told her at the beginning, I said, I'm here to learn how how I can do what you do. Like, how do I be like you? And she said, you've come to the right spot. But I guarantee you, after she met me, she used to always say, I hope you never leave me because we just really clicked that way. And then there came that time where I said, you know, it is time for me to venture off. It's time for me to build my team. It's time for me to bring more folks on that look like me, that have the same ideas as me, the same, you know, um, goals as me, you know, not that they don't have individuality, but I, I, I wanted to be more around like-minded people. And most of those team members were kind of in an older mindset and had been in real estate for a while. And I wanted to just really build off of what our world is doing right now. And so I went to my now previous brokerage, um, where, 
Matt and Jessica's side have been amazing mentors to me. They have guided me along having my team. I built my my team, Williams Home Girl Sales. I built that there. But what consists of myself and two other agents. There I would say every other month, and I could be off by a month, but I was a top producer. This past year, I was, I was with them for two years. And this past year, I sold $12 million in gross commission sales. Last year, I taught myself off. I think it was about right around 10 million. So we're up a little bit from this year. And knowing what I know now and and building the way that I have been able to build brings me to um, starting my own brokerage. The goal of the brokerage is to ultimately have a space that where everybody is welcome for one. You know, I have a mission and I should have had it pulled up right now so I can read exactly what it says. Sorry, I want I want to really read it exactly what it says. No, that's okay. And you can also um send it to me later. I would love to share that. Oh yeah. Okay. Awesome. So I'll send it to you later. Um, but it basically just talks about how we work with our clients and uplift them and including everybody while we're doing that uplifting, while we're being the best, the best person that we are, it allows us to be the best we can be for our clients. Um, so it's basically what the mission is. And my goal right now in connection with housing is now that I am the legislative lead for housing and homeless advocacy in that role, I get to basically in, in all of my roles, I get to see a the world in a um, magnified view, if you will. And if you've seen ever seen those, those, what are they called? They're like little crystals, but they have so many different views to them when you look in them you you put it up to something and it just looks a different way and oh, I can't like think of it's called maybe a prism but I can't think of yeah. it when you that's what I feel like I'm looking at the world with right now because there's so many different sides to me and I relate to so many different people like I said when I'm dealing in housing and homeless advocacy I'm seeing all of my folks who are and typically those are the more marginal marginalized individuals and marginal marginalized folks typically are you know of the BIPOC community um that's just that's just how life has been over the past years. And uh, I know we're chipping at the old block to break that away, but the truth is most of those communities are of the BIPOC communities. And so with that said, I'm, I'm seeing my folks that um, are unable to make their rent payments um, because they're being raised in an astro- at an astronomical um, uh, increase. Uh, We're talking like, you know, some are going from $600 to $1,200 and they're expected to pay that in the next month's rent. And I'm seeing the emotional stress, the mental stress that folks are going through. I've seen people go from working, you know, full time jobs to being homeless on the streets. And, And sometimes it's not because they can't get connected with services. It's because they've just given up. It's been too much. So I've seen that side and I work in with directly with a group of individuals over at the Housing Alliance. And then when it's legislative session, also working with our lawmakers to help provide different services. Um, we did a lot of rental assistance when COVID hit. Um, so um, hoping and working together to um, bring testimony in front of the lawmakers so that they can change laws and make them make this community a better place, right? I mean, that's that's really what this is all about and what we should be wanting to do. And then in my real estate world where, where I typically work in acquisition and the uh, sale of homes and some commercial units as well, I uh, just re- recently was added as the Washington Association of Realtors DEI uh, committee member. So I <laughs> am going over to talk about how we can change within the Washington Association of Realtors so that we are more inclusive. Like, how do we really invite people in? And I I have some things that I won't share because I don't want it to get public until it's out there. But we do have some things that we are really working on to make it so that 
it is more affordable for people to own homes, right? Or to even work in the industry because it can be a very lucrative industry, but it's so closed off that most people can't even afford to even try to start it. And so working towards setting something up that will be of the benefit for some folks to actually get an opportunity. Because at this time, you almost have to be a unicorn to be able to be successful in an industry like this one. We have a lot of people that join it, but can you can you be in it and be successful? Can you connect with the right team or connect with the right firm or the people that you need to connect with so that you can be the best part of you that that other people need? And so working on that, um, maybe uh, another example that I hope to bring up is the fact that some of our forms just are not um, inclusive enough to the different relationships that are within our communities. We're dealing with transgender individuals. We're dealing with um, polyamorous individuals. We're dealing with um, all the different pronouns that are out there right now. And I think that our forms need to be uh, more inclusive as it relates to that because it makes it not only are we respecting people and who they want to be, but it makes it easier for us to do our job because First of all, relationship is all about, excuse me, real estate is all about relationships. I learned that at my very first day sitting at the computer. Real estate is about building relationships. And if I walk up to somebody who has different pronouns or they want to have all of their partners on an application, but I can only fit three, where, where does that end us up at? Not at a great first impression for a relationship. I can tell you that right now. What my business also does is in real estate, of course, I love music. I love, love, love music. I've been a singer since I was three years old. I believe that the word says that, you know, your gift will make room for you. So what I'm doing is utilizing while I'm helping in the housing arena, I'm utilizing my voice. And sometimes that's the singing voice. And sometimes it's just a voice that speaks um, about, you know, what the struggle is. And that would be, you know, going and speak with the legislator and all that. But I do have a singing voice and I have utilized that platform um, where people uh, say that they like to come hear me sing. And so if you notice that any of my shows, all, all of my shows, I always have a portion in there why I, I call it, I pour into people. So I pour into them encouragement. I think a lot of us are lacking the ability, sometimes the ability to encourage and then the um, lacking people that can and will encourage us. And so that uh, that makes us go deeper into, you know, these these thoughts that are not conducive to our growth. Right. And um, and so we just need somebody that's going to be willing to just bring the peace sometimes, you know, kind of like Marvin Gaye and, and Al Green and how it was back then. I feel like they had so much going on right then that that really in some areas illuminates what we have going on here. And I think that with housing and employment and housing would be at the top of of the discrepancy list for me. And so with me being connected to both avenues, I utilize that stage to be able to encourage people and get information for people, offer them a sense of hope, um, at, at sometimes where the, the world is the darkest and, and most hopeless place. I mean, just having them come out. And a lot of the times, I think at every one of our events, we've had giveaways. And so we're very intentional about um, where we have our shows at and making sure that they're affordable for people to come and view. Um, I've partnered with a few different organizations that have that have helped us to uh, be able to put on shows. So Spark Central, we did um, some shows with them last year. I will be performing again with them in April. We did um, a group called Girls Rock, where we were able to, we had two weeks with these young ladies. We talked uh, we um, did workshops on writing songs. We did workshops on um, charisma. I did. I taught a workshop on charisma and uh, what it's like to have that inner charisma that you can just tap into and be yourself. Because when you're your most authentic self, that's what people crave, your authenticity. Because believe it or not, people can see it when you're not being yourself. And so that was really fun. When I do do um, different performances, Williams Home Girl Sales and now Vision Properties, uh, they uh, also sponsor it. So 
I take the money back from what we make in, in real estate and put it back out there so that people can enjoy themselves and again, come and be encouraged so that they can encourage somebody else in the future. I really love that. <laughs> Thank you. Because I've just been talking, girl, and I, I don't know when I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> I mean, no, uh, this, has been, this has been really great. I've learned so much about you. I've only, I think we've just kind of been in similar spaces in, in the community over the last year. And so I do want to, to back up because I have so many questions. Okay, um, yeah. And housing is definitely, you know, I think one of the biggest issues. It's what people are talking about, both, I think, at a national level, definitely locally. And then legislative session just started yesterday. This housing, is it a committee that you're involved in? The Alliance? Sorry. Are you talking about? Oh, OK. Yes. Yeah. So I'm the, the legislative lead for housing and homeless advocacy for District 4. And then so District 4 is um, Spokane Valley, but I also help out with District 6 because I live you know, I'm from Spokane. So um, when I go and I'm talking with the legislators, I always say four and six. So, so this kind of ties together because um, I also didn't know um, that you were incarcerated. And I think, you know, when people do come out of incarceration, they just think, oh, that's it. You've done your time. But no one thinks about, you know, having to kind of pick your life up and that there are no pathways to take care of people after they've been incarcerated. No. Um, I can't remember his name, but he had brought this up at a, a legal forum back um, during midterms. And he said, you know, when people get out of incarceration, there's no like, there's no like housing set up for them. There's nothing for them. They're kind of on their own for getting job placement, for getting, you know, a safe place to live. And so from from your experience, like, what do you wish more people knew about that, you know, and, and what it's like to um, have to kind of like start over and like, yeah. you know, not have those resources. I'm glad you said that because uh, I always forget to put a plug in for my new accountability program that I launched um, mid mid summer. I think that was. I think that the hardest part for me when I got out and and God was with me, of course. But I think that the hardest part, uh, one of the hardest parts, was being put in a place that I didn't know. I, I am from Spokane. I am a black woman. And I was sent to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, because that was the only place that they had. And to be more specific, Hayden, Idaho is where I worked. And so I did deal with some some racial issues that probably could have been prevented if I would have been somewhere where I knew um, where I was familiar with, but I also understand that it's sometimes good to take people out of what they're familiar with so that they can try to build a new life. Uh, the other thing that I would say that I struggled the most with was not having somebody that was actually there to hold me accountable. Now, I will say this, the um, my accountability pro program is a little bit based off of this. So in the halfway house, what they do is they make you kind of write down what you're going to do for the day and you actually have to stick with it. So if you go a different route, they call it deviating and you're 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 not you're no longer in compliance. Right. So you can get in a write up, if you will, or whatnot for that. In the accountability program that I started, I realized that we are, if we have peer accountability, we hold ourselves accountable for what we're going to do. So what we do is we fill out a daily form. I have adults that do this. I have an adult that a paid accountability program. And then I also have a youth accountability program of which I just received um, a grant through OSPI to do. So I have about 19, I might as well just said 20, um, but there's 15 to 20 students that I have right now that are actively filling out um, daily forms a day. And what they do is we talk about, I believe in small goals. Because what happens is you're like, I want a house. I want to buy a house. I want to buy a car. I want to do all right. this. And you don't even know how to work a computer when you get out of prison if you've been in there for that long. Yeah, you right? know, like So setting those huge goals are ways that you you um, 
you set yourself up for failure because when you don't attain or achieve those bigger goals, then you're like, oh, I'm a failure. I can't do it. And so setting smaller goals is the best way to do. So what we do is we do weekly goals. So your big weekly goal might be to, um, and you do a professional for my students, it's a school goal and um, a uh, personal goal. So um, for my students, uh, for uh, one of my students today said, I need to get all of my D's up to, um, I want to get them up to C's. Now, is that possible? Because I've taught them, like, you you have the ability to look up and see, you know, if you are, are very far behind and there aren't really any assignments that are going to get you there, don't psych yourself out. I don't want you to not psych yourself up, but don't set yourself up for failure, right? Is it realistic that within a week you'll be able to do that? Yes. Okay, perfect. So let's do that. So her goal was to get her goal, her um, D's up to C's. And then it was her personal goal was to stay, um, to go to every class. I think it was to go to every class because she's been absent and therefore missing work. Therefore, she's got D's. So every day you put the same weekly goal until you hit another week. But every um, day, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to do three must do goals that are attached to getting you to do to get your your D's up to C's. Right. So and let me know if I'm giving too much information because I get really super passionate about this type of stuff. No, I um, actually I want to learn more. Is this a program that you're just doing? You're running by yourself? Yeah, so I own the program. Um, it's an accountability program, and I just have it underneath my my housing. So here's the thing. Let me. I won't even go into the depths of of the forms and stuff. Here's here's my thing: is that we do promote a lot of doctors, and you can you know we want you to be a dentist, and we want you to be all these different you know NBA player, football player, whatever, right? But we don't talk about some businesses that really can be sustainable and help change people's lives and and, um, build generational wealth. That's real estate. These kids Mm -hmm. don't have a lot of information about that. Mm -hmm. These folks that are formerly incarcerated don't even realize that they have the ability to do it. They don't have the ability. And so what I what I would say is this is that so working with these students, the goal is to get them give them more information about how they can retain what they're given, right? We can give every marginalized, BIPOC, a disparity, whatever you want. We can give every single one of them a down payment for a house. But if we give them a down payment for a house and don't teach them how to keep it, don't teach them what they need to budget, don't teach them what they need to maintain it, then we failed. We failed them. We've, we've adversely affected their ability to you know be successful and so the goal is to start with this accountability program and work their way up so that not only could they possibly venture off venture off into a real estate career have a mentor in doing so right um to have a scholarship to do that because every other program has a scholarship for it right so why can't real estate have a scholarship for it and and then not only are we building their career, building their future so that they can be prepared to not just rent an apartment for the rest of their lives, but they can own something and build generational wealth. And this sometimes might be like first generation for a lot of these students, right? So I thought, why take and go? And, I, and I'm, I'm not saying that this isn't good for older folks to know. I think that, you know, they should own. OK, but what I'm saying is sometimes we're remiss when we don't think about the youth that are our future. They're the future. So if we teach them while they're young enough to be able to retain, to be able to sustain the gifts that are given to them. And I'm talking about the gift of knowledge when they get that, when they can sustain that and actually do something with it, then we have changed the world. And that's what our goal is. Our goal is to change the world. Our goal is to make this a better place. Our goal is so that we see less and less people out there holding signs and we actually are giving them tools that they need so that they can attain what they need to attain. That's amazing. And yeah, especially for BIPOC people, my parents... They only, the only thing they own in this entire country is their house. Wow. Yep. There you go. You know, wow. They, and they came here, they came, well, they came to California in the eighties, you know, and that's, that's it. And there are other families who are from, you know, somewhere in the United States and they've got 
an old lake house or they have like a huge family house that they've just like passed on generation to generation. And when I was younger, like no one was really talking about that, at least, you know, not to me about like, how am I going to ensure in my future and, you know, kind of invest in, in some kind of legacy in that way and what it means to own property. Like, I feel like as a homeowner, as a woman of color, as a queer woman of color who is not from Washington, I feel Mm -hmm. like I'm cheating the system somehow. And it shouldn't feel like that, right? Like it should feel good to own a home or to own, you know, something, own a piece of property. So so you're right there. We're right there on the same page. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I, (laughs) I, kind of uh, like I kind of want to talk about your experience also as being like a realtor and like what that has been like in Spokane I think you've touched on it a little bit I also want to talk about you know what it was like during um the early pandemic when things had just skyrocketed and everything was kind of in chaos yeah um so I was actually listing a property that day that the governor said that we were all shutting down for the pandemic. Um, we weren't all really sure how serious it was, but my I remember my clients looking at me and saying, Latrice, are we going to be able to sell our house? Um, and we're in a time where the market was booming, right? So, and what I mean by booming is like, you put a house on the market on the weekend, it's gone the next, you know, on Monday. And if not, gone the next day. I mean, that's how swiftly it was moving. And we went from... Um, I assured my clients everything would be fine to um, going from, you know, having people show up for open houses to having to find a better way. And thank God for technology and me having some type of knowledge of it because I started doing virtual open houses immediately. So that day I did a a walkthrough while my clients were gone. The governor gave us until midnight to to stop showing. And so I did a walkthrough. It was a virtual walkthrough and I put it on Facebook Um, and we were still able to sell it. And right now, the one thing that the pandemic did was teach us that we have a lot of ability to do things a whole lot easier than what we have in the past. Um, and I know some sometimes employers don't like that that's what happened, but that's exactly what happened. And I think that it hasn't affected us in a negative way. It's affected us in a positive way as it relates to that, especially during the pandemic, the, the interest rates plummeted because they weren't sure what was going to happen to the housing market with everybody not able to come out. Some folks could work, some folks couldn't, some folks were deemed essential, and some folks had to quit their job or were were fired. And so um, real estate was deemed essential and we did keep going um, and we were able to help folks achieve a lot of, we had a lot of folks that had never been able to in the past, we had them be able to purchase homes because the interest rates went down so much that property values did increase at a rapid rate because there were so many houses that were selling and so little houses that were out there to sell. There were just so many buyers that were looking at purchasing and it left, you know, first of all, it it made houses were going much, much quicker off the market and it gave the sense of urgency to people. And so that played a a big part of, you know, houses flying off the market and those values shoot skyrocketing up. So Um, The pandemic, we made it through um, because we figured out different ways to actually achieve what we needed to. I don't know how to answer your question about what it's like being a realtor because I don't know my expression to you at the beginning when I was talking about, you know, being added to the top 20 percent and how I felt. I mean, that's the best description I can give to you. I've never felt like I really belonged um, here in this industry and it not that everybody treated me differently, but there was enough of people that looked at me differently and and did treat me differently that it felt uncomfortable to me. But that and all things I've always, with that and all things I've always had to kind of just 
figure out where I fit my own mold though. I'm not trying to fit into anybody else's mold. And so I began to kind of build my brand. And if you go back and watch any of my listing videos, you'll be able to hear that song. It's a song that I wrote. I'm the home girl and I sell houses. You know, I'm the home girl. And that's, that's kind of basically a culture thing for us, right? Home girl, but homes, like homes, houses, and home girl. So I'm the house home girl. Um, and that's who I am. And people either like it or they don't like it. I would say that um, as far as the the uh, clients, they like it more more so than, than others because everywhere that I've been, I've always been a top agent. So people have always found respite in my in my uh, communication skills and my research skills and my follow up. And I think that that has um, supported me all this time and allowed me to be who I am. Do you, you know, like as as a woman of color, because I think you had mentioned this earlier that like, do you ever feel torn between wanting to be an example and then not wanting to do that work of like educating people on why like representation, inclusivity and diversity are, are important? Never. I don't bite my tongue. Um, if it needs to be said, it needs to be said. And I have a, a, I feel like I have a good approach with people on having to explain things, but I'm not going to shy away from who I am or who I think if somebody needs an assistance, if somebody is, um, you know, another um, BIPOC realtor or community member is struggling, I'm not going to shy away from that just because of, you know, what what um, career I have? Absolutely not. This is what we I've been yes. given a platform where people listen, and what what better way? What other better way to use it? I mean, there's no other way. No no better way other than you know getting up on the singing stage. But the same, it's the same type of thing to me because it's all intertwined. I, I use this platform for a very specific reason. Um, again, I'm very intentional about what's on my website. I'm very intentional about what's in my on my Facebook page. I'm very intentional about um, the colors and what they represent. I was very intentional about Williams Home Girl Sales logo. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's a silhouette of people. It's a silhouette. It's a silhouette because I didn't want there to be color. I didn't want there to be a black girl, a Latino girl, a, a, a native girl up there. I just, whoever we are, whoever we are, that's, we're doing, we're doing real estate. Now, I've always been very intentional about the message that I send out. If you know anything about me, I very rarely dress up. I'm definitely going to try to start doing a little bit of dress up because I just want to go shopping because I love shopping. But, but if you see me showing houses, I'm likely in a sweatsuit in some J's. I mean, that is my, that's my uniform. That's my attire because that's who I am. I feel most comfortable that way. I know how to fix myself up and go into meetings and present myself well to folks who may not understand my way, but eventually you are definitely going to see, you know, what, what I feel most comfortable in. And I don't apologize for that because it's who I am. How do you keep that going? Like, where do you get that? That's like a strength to me. And I don't always have that. So like, how do you keep that in mind all the time? You know, like, how do you remind yourself, like, this is who I am. This is who I want to be. And yeah. to like, be comfortable taking up that space, you know, because yeah. it's, it's, yeah, really I gotta be careful. Because, because when I get in my feelings, because we all have those times where we get in our feelings, right? Like, I'm not doing this anymore. I, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to mm -hmm. go out there with them. They don't want me here. Da, 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 da. I've had many of feelings like that. As a matter of a fact, I just was asked to speak at the Young Professionals Network for Realtors and Lenders. I think it's Realtors and Lenders. And um, it was at the, over at the Garland Theater. And I had this whole big PowerPoint presentation ready to rock and roll about, you know, how you can be yourself. And then that wasn't even me. So I got up there and you know what I did? I performed my song. I'm a homegirl and I sell houses and I performed the whole song and everybody. Yes. <laughs> and I was so concerned that I was not going to be able to present as myself until I got up there and became myself. And I, it took me a lot. Like I, I hired coaches, um, a charisma coach. I hired a charisma coach to be able to help me tap into those, those most, the parts that really 
speak to who I am and to always be authentic to myself. And I think that the times that I feel like I'm getting down, I have to remember, and I'm always reminded because they're always there. <laughs> I have seven kids. I have four boys and three girls. I'm their future. You know, I mean, excuse me, they're my future. And they're looking to me. They're looking to me to see how I handle situations. They're looking to me to see how, you know, oh, mom, that lady just called you, da, 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 you know, what you, what you going to do about it? They're paying attention. They're paying attention when I say, man, I really don't want to go out there because I know they don't like me. How dare we set our kids up for that, right? That's me setting them up to turn around and say that when it's time for them to make their presentation at school or when some when they need to be, you know, sticking up for them, themselves. And so I think it's important for us. And then those who don't have children, um, just remember that none of us are going to be here forever. So what legacy do you want to leave? You got to do something. You know, because yeah. one thing for so sure, two things for certain, ain't none of us sticking around here forever. So how do you want to be remembered? You know, and that's how I I keep and I'm a very spiritual person. I know that <laughs> sorry, I said it every time. Look, I'm a very spiritual person and I do believe in the power of prayer. I do believe in um, affirmations. I think affirmations are very important. So if you don't believe something about yourself or you don't feel like you have the um the power or the go to be who you need to be for yourself, then what I would suggest is that you come up with, um, you know, what God says about you. Go find what God says about you. That's what I do. Every morning we write down affirmations and we say them because if I don't believe something about myself, then I'm going to make sure that by the end of the week or by even hopefully by the end of the day, but by the end of the week, I am going to internally believe that, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm all about manifesting. And so um, I don't tell my students to do anything that I don't do. I believe that if you, that words are very powerful. One thing I do stay away from, or I, 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 um, I uh, try to stay away from, I can't say that it's all the time because we all have our negative thoughts, but you got to know that your thoughts turn into words and your words turn into actions. Be careful what you're thinking about yourself because soon you'll be saying it about yourself. And so I'm um, just making sure that you're keeping all the control because um, you are in control of what you put into your body. And I'm not just talking about what you digest, but I'm talking about what you see, what you hear. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to be hate, but yeah. <laughs> that is a really good way to, to frame that. We only have a few minutes left, but I would love to hear more about your music, what is in store for you this year, what you're working on right now. Yes, I actually am in the middle of writing a book. So my book and my EP was supposed to release on January 11th, and I'm going to be pushing that date back to February 23rd, 2023. I am in a healing process, and so I'm healing through music. So a lot of the music that you hear from me right now is going to be um, more like um, women power type stuff, like I got over it, and now I'm moving on, and now let me encourage myself. And so you, the things that I was just saying to you, you will definitely hear that spill out into my music. I like to write music that that is easily easy caught on to. Um, and so with that said, please, please, please find me on YouTube, Latrice Williams. You can go check out a couple of my singles, My Soul. Uh, the other single is My Story. And then, or excuse me, The Story, My Soul, and Gas. Gas is um, basically a soundtrack for, um, and all of them are music videos. So you can go check them out um, when you have some time. Or I'm so sorry, two of them are music videos. I don't have a music video yet released for the story, but Gas is talking about me coming out of prison and having a fresh start and changing my life and, and just ready to rock and roll and make it new. And so that's a lot of what you're going to hear in the book. The book. Uh, just a little plug right here because nobody knows what the book is about. So I guess I'll tell you um, yes. the book is um, it will start at the day that we were rest arrested back in 2008. And then it will be up into current time of um, when I became a real estate broker. So it is definitely going to give the ins and outs of inside. And it's going to talk about um, the struggle that I had when I came home. So please go check that out. The name of the book is Project 835859. And believe it or not, that is my DOC number 
from the Department of Corrections. So I think, and the reason why I wanted to do the book because and name the book that, excuse me, is because they talk a lot about wanting to put people in prison to rehabilitate them. And I wanted to make sure that I told a real story, an authentic story of this struggle and um, <clears throat> also of the, um, of the uh, success. So the struggle and the success, because I don't think people understand how hard it is um, to be successful and to be sitting where I am today to now only being in real estate for four years, you know, not and being a successful agent and now owning my own firm. It's just I, I just sometimes I, I have to wake up and pinch myself like what's happening here, <laughs> you know?